I want you to turn your Bibles, first of all, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tonight. You know there's some verses in the Bible that are just absolutely astounding. I believe all the Bible. I believe everything that he says. And I think you're making a bad mistake not to. But that doesn't mean I understand all the verses of the Bible. I wish you'd said amen to that. If you understand all the verses in the Bible, you got some things to really teach me. As a matter of fact, if you keep your hand there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. If you look at verse 12, this is one of those verses that just really flabbergasts me. The promise is so amazing. I can't say that I've ever experienced it in its fullness. And obviously, when you look at Scripture, what we want to do is we want to push our feelings and our experiences into the verse. Whether And as a result, we normally downgrade what he's saying, and that's a mistake. In verse 12, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, well, that's me. Is that you too? He that believeth on me. So for at least most of us, that's us. He says, The works that I do shall he do also. And greater, now this is what gets me. And greater works than these shall he do. Who's the he here? That's me. That's you. Now Jesus is speaking on the night before the crucifixion. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. I just... Be quite honest with you, I haven't done them yet. Have you? Have you done greater works than he did? To me, that's an awesome verse. That's, well, go over to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Right now, we're just gathering around the word and sharing. In verse 22, the Bible says, Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now that is an awesome promise I don't think I've come close to experiencing the depth and the height of that promise that's powerful I'm getting the impression from reading these verses that we should be seeing a lot more happen than what we see happen and I dare say that's probably true of most all the Christians I know That's a promise from Jesus himself. Now, you've heard people say, Jesus has promised to meet your needs, but not necessarily your wants or desires. And yet the next verse, the very next verse, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, I think taking it contextually, when your desire is on the things of the Lord... That that's what he is dealing with. It's not just, hey, I want a million dollars. I, I want, uh, uh, you know, a new car. I want this and that. This isn't a name it and claim it thing, you know. But nevertheless, these are absolutely amazing promises by God. Which tells me that for the most part, we're probably still in kindergarten. Kindergarten. 
we have awesome promises. And unfortunately, what happens when we come across great promises like those, our tendency is to explain them away. Because otherwise, we don't feel that we look very spiritual. Oh, maybe that's because we're not very spiritual. That could be the reason we need to get more spiritual and see God even do greater things. Now, obviously, at Madison Baptist Church over these years, we've seen God do a lot of really tremendous things. I think we've seen God do some things that can only be explained by God. Amen. We've seen that. But I don't think, I, I really don't believe that that should be just a once or twice in a lifetime deal. We have a powerful God. And he does answer prayer in powerful ways. Now, with that in mind, we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I find a verse here that obviously must not be believed by a lot of people. And it wouldn't just be in Baptist churches today. I believe it. I don't know that I've ever experienced this to its fullness either. And yet the church has. When I say the church, I'm not necessarily talking about Madison Baptist Church. I'm talking about real, true, Bible-defined churches. But notice verse 10. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all... Well, now, if he's talking about ye all, we need to find out who he's talking to. So for just a moment, I want you to go on up to verse 2. And he says, Under the church of God, which is at Corinth. So he is writing to the church at Corinth. And he's telling the church at Corinth, and this is good for every church. It's not just good for the church at Corinth. Otherwise, God wouldn't have kept it here for all of us to read. He said, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, that is an introduction to the first thing he's going to talk about in 1 Corinthians. He is dealing with this church because it's a troubled church. It is a church that is so troubled that he says to them, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? This is not a spiritual church. This is a carnal church. He calls them that. And they had a lot of problems. In the first four chapters, he's dealing with division in the church. And he introduces the subject by saying, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. What do you think he means by no divisions? Yeah, no division. No division. How often do you see that? Because there's always somebody that's got to differ. I mean, there's always... And every, every church that I know of, there's always somebody cantankerous enough that they're not going along with anything. They're going to see to it. And it doesn't make any difference if the church is running 1,000 or just running 20. There'll be somebody in there. You know, it's like the guy, the church was voting on a chandelier. And the guy, uh, and the guy voted it down. He voted against it. And they said, why are you against it? He says, I don't see why we need a chandelier. Number one, nobody knows how to even spell it. Besides that, what we need here is more light. <laughs> you know, there's something like that. But there was a time when the church seemed to have it together. Now, last week I dealt with the church at Jerusalem and why the center of the missionary work went from the church at Jerusalem to the church at Antioch. And we saw that quite plainly in the book of Acts. But let's go back to the book of Acts a moment. We wonder why they were blessed so much in the very beginning. Let me give you a couple verses here. Look at verse 14. Speaking of the 120 that are praying in the upper room, it says in verse 14, these all continued with 
one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. You'll notice right at the very beginning, Jesus has just ascended up into heaven. The church has been told that they're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But Jesus also told them, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So Jesus has ascended up into heaven, they're left behind. And here they are praying, the Bible says, in one accord. That's how they were to pray. By the way, that's how we're to pray. In one accord. You go over to chapter 2 and verse 1, and it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You're talking about 10 days later. The church is still praying, and they are still in one accord. They are united in purpose in their prayer. I can't tell you over the years how many times that we've called prayer meetings for particular things, and there's always somebody that's got to pray for everything but the thing that we meant there to pray about. They don't seem to get it together about being in one accord. And obviously, if we can't seem to pray in one accord, it's, it's hard to believe that we're going to be in one accord. And yet, that's what God wants the church to be, in purpose especially, and as we pray. Now, this interesting statement, in one accord, we find it several times in the book of Acts, and several times with reference to the church that was at Jerusalem. And especially in the first few chapters, you see it several times. Now, I'm going, we're going to go through them. First of all, with the two that we just read, they were in one accord with supplication, that is, with their prayers. They had two commands. They were to preach the gospel to every creature, and they were to pray until they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So they had met together. Now, the Bible does not tell us how many hours they prayed a day. We don't know if they stopped to go home and go to bed. Probably did. Maybe they did. I would suggest that perhaps, more than likely, they prayed at least 10 hours each day. And I'm just guessing. Might have been more than that. Might have been 16 hours. But for 10 straight days, imagine if we called a prayer meeting because we want to reach North Alabama with the gospel of Christ. Now, we can come up with all kinds of programs, but that's the thing. We're trusting in programs today instead of the power of God. That's a lot of the problem with our churches. We think if we can get the right program, we can get the right plan. When God's plan was you pray, I'll send the power. Then you go out and preach, and God will do some great things. Amen. Now, that's God's program. That's the plan he gave the church. And man, were they successful. But some things will happen when you start praying like that. When the church gets settled to where... Man, we want to pray. We want to see souls saved. We want to see a difference here with people being born again throughout the city. It's not because we're trying to build a big church. Uh, it's because God loves souls. He sent his son for souls. That should be our burden to see souls come to know Christ as Savior. So this is the beginning key right here. Why are we here? To win souls. For that, we need God's power. And our command is very, very clear. So as they begin praying, something becomes pretty obvious. And as the Apostle Peter ends up speaking up to these people in chapter 1, he says in verse, oh, let's see, let's go to, uh, uh, let's go to verse 20, where Peter says, for it is written, in, he just talked about Judas and him hanging himself, and he says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And the Bible says, And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, 
who is surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. You notice they didn't put it up for a church vote. They said, Lord, show us. Now notice what they did. It says that he, might, he may take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas has transgre- by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so here they are. They're praying. We don't know how many days into it they prayed. And in reading the scripture, they realized that the scripture said someone needed to take Judas's place. They found that in the book of Psalms while they were praying in one accord. And so they then cast lots between Matthias and uh, the other guy. Uh, let's see, who was the guy? Uh, Barsabbas or Justice. I uh, cast lots and the lot fell on Matthias. And so he was picked. Now, I've heard preachers get up and say the church did wrong right away. And I don't know where you get that from this passage. They say Paul was definitely the 12th apostle. No, he wasn't numbered with the 12. Uh, number one, he wasn't there from the time of, uh, time of John the Baptist and the baptism of John the Baptist. He didn't see all those things that Messiah, Matthias and uh, Justice had seen. See, here's the problem. If, if you say that they shouldn't have chose him, they should have chosen Paul, you've got a number of problems. Number one, they'd been praying for days. They had read the scripture and saw that someone was to take his place. They picked two men with the right qualifications, and they asked the Lord to choose which one. And they used Lot. The book of Proverbs said, the casting of the Lot casteth out strife. Because, you see, it's not a personality thing. It's not the one who's liked the most. Here are two men that meet the qualifications. And so it falls upon Matthias, and they pick him, and the very next thing that happens after that is they are filled with the Holy Ghost. Had they done wrong, I doubt they would have been filled next with the Holy Spirit of God. There's another thing. God doesn't say they did wrong. God does not correct them, but he blesses them by filling them with the Holy Ghost of God, and 3,000 end up getting saved. Amen. Now, that's pretty powerful stuff right there. That's what happens when the church is in accord. Obviously, had they done wrong, it would not have been a day of 3,000 getting saved and baptized. It had been a time for God's correction. God knows how to correct his people when they're wrong. So they were seeking to obey the Lord and they prayed. And that's what we ought to do. Seek to obey the Lord and pray. Main job that we're here for. But it doesn't stop there with that. Because next we see him again in one accord in chapter 2. In chapter 2 and verse 46, the scripture says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house that eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Look at this. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now we find out after we have Peter's message, which is recorded for us, uh, we find out it says in verse 40, and with many other words he did testify and exhort saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 in one day. How is that possible? How about the church being in one accord? And spending 10 days praying in one accord. Where people were praying for the same thing. I, I read a prayer letter uh, just this week. And it was a missionary, praise the Lord, for his burden for mission, burden for souls. And they gave some statistics at the bottom of the prayer letter. The bottom of the prayer letter, it said in the last month that they, ha they had 4,700 souls saved. 
thought, wow, that's a good, that's a good month right there. 4,700 souls saved. Now, how often do you hear that? That's great. But then the next number kind of bothered me because they did that that month, and I'm assuming that they probably supposedly, it's like that all the time. I looked at a previous prayer letter. It wasn't the same amount, but it was close to that. But then the next number he gave was we had 18 baptized. Really? That's a little over three one-thousandths of a percent. Now, I praise the Lord for 18 baptized. I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. But I go to the day of Pentecost. They had 3,000 saved, and they had 3,000 baptized. Now, Obviously, it is New Testament for us to go soul winning. It is New Testament for us to baptize the believers. But I'm thinking if what I read in that prayer letter, if that is New Testament practice, then what should have happened if we carry that back to the day of Pentecost, that means when they had 3,000 saved and baptized, they would have had to have 81,000 professions of faith to end up getting 3,000 people baptized in one day. And I'm thinking, that doesn't work out right. That can't be true. And the church, it says at the bottom part, gained 10 from the previous month. Well, now that doesn't seem right. I mean, I'm just, listen, you know, sometimes the New Testament when you read it, sometimes its fruits don't, don't simply measure up to what some people are bragging about, and I wouldn't be bragging about that. There's something wrong with the numbers. Now, if you want to say you had 4,700 professions of faith and you baptized 18, okay. But I'd be a little concerned, what's going on with my presentation to have these numbers so totally out of whack? Now, we got, a, we got several older people in this church, and there are times when you go to the doctor and they look at your numbers from the blood test or other tests that they may give you, and the doctor calls you up and says, you know, your numbers are out of whack. And when you hear about your numbers being, whether it's your sugar numbers or your cholesterol numbers or your blood pressure numbers, normally they try to do something to make them right. Isn't that correct? And when I hear of stuff like what I read in that prayer letter, I'm thinking there's something wrong with the numbers here. This just does not add up. There is a problem. Now, I'm not using this to run down any mystery. Thank God for their going soul winning. That needs to continue. That's fine. That's right. But what is going on with the presentation? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You have 4,700 get saved. Sure, some of them may have been from out of town. They may have gone off. But you ought to have at least a couple thousand being baptized. If this is New Testament practice. Or have we gotten so good with a presentation, whether you want to call it easy prayerism or something like that, have we gotten so good with a presentation that there's really not, not much power in it at all and we're getting people to pray the prayer without really getting it? Because there's something wrong with those numbers. Now, perhaps that's why a lot of our fundamental churches, of which we are one, Perhaps that is the reason why there is so much lack of being in one accord over our very message because something seems to be wrong numerically with what's going on. Man, I'd love to see 3,000 saved in a day. But I wouldn't be satisfied with 3,000 saved and five people getting baptized. There'd be something wrong with that. That, said, that would say we're doing something wrong. The soul winning is good. The soul winning is right. Keep going soul winning. Keep knocking on doors. 
And hey, I thank God for the 18 that got baptized. Say, how many of those 4,700 do you think got saved? All of them that believed. And I don't know what that number was, but somewhere. Maybe it's their follow-up program. Because you go back here to verse 41, uh, where he says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Notice, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. He's talking about those that got saved and baptized. And they, the 3,000, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, that's powerful stuff. And at this point, this church is in one accord. I've heard people say things like, well, you know, the church can grow too fast. I just don't know any church where that's a problem. Most of the churches I know were not growing fast enough. Not with the power of the gospel, power of the Holy Spirit of God as we present the gospel. Uh, we ought to be seeing a lot more. Following the Lord, uh, getting saved, following the Lord and believers' baptism. Now, that's us too. But I think the key, what we can draw from the passage that we read, is that a church in one accord that prays in one accord that's seeking what the purpose of the church is here left to do, and that's reach the lost world with the gospel of Christ. That is our goal. That is our purpose. That is what we're after. That as they stay in one accord, they're going to see God do some awful, powerful things. One accord. So they were not only in one accord in their supplication, but they were in one accord in their continuation. They continued steadfastly. And as it said there in chapter 2 and verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now see, when I read scripture like this, I want to apply it to my life. I believe the Bible is to be applied to our lives. It's to be applied to our ministries, to be applied to our church. I still believe the scripture is the final rule of faith and practice. I think we've done real good. We've got, uh, man, we've got a lot of people to write different articles, all kinds of things, and they break everything down real neat, nice piles, and boy, doesn't it all look good. And meanwhile, churches are dead as last year's Christmas tree. Now, we need to stand firm by doctrine. Oh, that's exactly right. Let's make sure that we put all the scripture together because it all goes together. Some need to start meeting with other believers, meetings to be a blessing, to share the blessings of God and fellowship. That, that's what these people did. That helped them to stay together in one accord. Can you imagine what, what that must have been like that next day when they met together? 3,000 people. And suddenly these apostles, they're still going to go out witnessing. Now they've got to set up meetings because they've got to teach these people. These are brand new believers. The apostles have been walking with Christ for three and a half years. And now they've got to impart to these new believers that so they can continue to win folks to Christ. Well, and there was one accord then in exaltation. You get over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 24 says this. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God, look at this, with one accord, and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Now, let me go ahead and back up a little bit here. You look at verse 23. And verse 23 says, And being let go, they went to their own company to report all the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. Uh, the elders told them they couldn't preach anymore in Jesus' name. So these ones that had been arrested, they go back to the church and they tell them that they've been told they're not to preach anymore in his name. They face being imprisoned if they preached anymore in his name. They're threatened with jail. 
So with one accord, they pray, number one. Number two, they praise the Lord. They praise the Lord with being threatened with jail. And so they make petition to God. Verse 27, it says, For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. You know what, see what they didn't ask for? They didn't ask to escape jail. Now, that seems strange. I think we probably would have prayed that next Wednesday night, Lord, please, change their heart so we can do this without going to jail. No, that's not how they prayed. So the Bible says in verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. That's what they asked for. And that's what they got. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. So they got together and prayed not to be delivered. But to be faithful and to have the boldness to still proclaim his name. Now imagine if Brother Jeff went out to knock on doors. And while he's knocking on doors, let's see, who was your Wednesday night partner, Wednesday morning partner this week? The first one was Danny Webb, and then the second one was uh, Brother Stickles. He goes by Stick. Yes. Okay. Well, let's say, let's say that while they're out knocking on doors, four cop cars show up. And they come up to him and say, what are you doing? They said, we're out representing Madison Baptist Church, trying to talk to people about the Lord. And they said to him, you know, that's fine, but you can't do that. We passed an ordinance. An ordinance was passed last month to where uh, nobody can do anything like that. You're soliciting. And if we catch you out here again, you're going to jail. And so they come back and they tell us as a church, we announce it on Wednesday that, uh, hey, the police have stopped... Uh, uh, Danny and Jeff, as they were knocking on doors and said, if we do any more knocking on doors in Madison, Alabama, that they're going to throw any of us in jail that they catch. What do you think the prayer meeting would be like that Wednesday night? Would we be in one accord to pray for boldness and power in witnessing anyway? What do you think the crowd would be like the next time we had church visitation where people were called in to go out? Now, now we, have, we have a decent soul winning crowd that goes out. And, of course, we got a bus crowd going out then. we got ladies that go out on Tuesday mornings and so on. Uh, but what do you think? What would be our mindset? Would we be in one accord or would we be in a debate about whether or not we ought to obey the ordinance of man that tells us to disobey God's command? Would we be in one accord over that? They were. And we'd have all kinds of excuses for never doing it until, matter of fact, what we need to do is we need to start writing letters and we need to get something else passed to get this undone. No, that's not what the New Testament church did. And what they did here was in one accord. Now, admittedly, these folks were upset because the Bible said back in chapter 4 and verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. So now that was just men. We don't know how many ladies that included, but there were men, 5,000 men who had gotten saved from the preaching of these apostles. It could have been something like this to where they get together and said, Well, you know, we had just had 3,000 saved. We've been adding to the church daily, such as should get saved. Now we've got 5,000 men. These people need to be taught. We don't need to knock on any more doors for a while. We don't need to be giving out tracts. We don't need to be passing out 
of the Word of God to anybody for a while because we got enough on our hands just discipling this crowd. But no, as a matter of fact, when they get threatened with beating, and they do get beaten in chapter 5, and in chapter 5 it says in verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. In one accord. This is one time in the history of the New Testament church where we see a power like most all of us have never seen. And it has to do with the church being in one accord. We are content with one or two getting saved once in a while. Thank God for the sprinkles, but we've hardly seen the showers a blessing that they saw. And then there was one accord in devotion. Now, in chapter 5, which we covered last week, something bad happens. They end up with some liars in church. And what it was, Ananias and Sapphira sold some property, gave it to the church. That was okay, but they said that what they were giving was everything they got out of the land, and they were lying about that. God killed them both. So notice beginning in verse 11. After Ananias and Sapphira had been taken out to be buried, it says, And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And I love verse 14. And believers were the more added to, to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, one accord in their devotion, not divided, in one accord. This church has not changed from what they were, even though they've had one minor setback in losing a couple of members that felt it was all right to lie to God. And then you got to wait. You don't read that term again, one accord. And they, they get stingy about their witnessing. They don't go out to witness to anybody but those in Judah and Judea, or in Jerusalem and Judea. Uh, they stay in Jerusalem. And they had been commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So then God sends persecution upon them in the person of uh, Saul of Tarsus. And they're spread out. Now they go out, they witness to a bunch of people. But notice, go over to chapter 15. Because by the time you get into chapter 15, things are changing. The center of the missionary fervor is switching to Antioch. We haven't read of the church being in one accord in some time. But in Acts chapter 15, some of the people that were in that church had started adding some things to the gospel. Some of those people who were zealous for the law had started telling people, you've got to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised according to the law of Moses in order to be saved. That's the salvation of works. That's like saying you've got to be baptized in order to be saved. It's a lie. It's wrong. And so they meet together and they discuss it. The apostle Paul had already taken a strong stand. Peter adds his voice to the apostle Paul's. James then speaks up, gives his opinion. And you'll notice, for instance, in verse 25, it says, And it seemed good unto us, that this is the letter that they're writing to the Gentile churches. It seemed good unto us being assembled, now look at it, with one accord. With one accord. Now I get the feeling that those people that had been talking about adding to the gospel that they have been voted out. They're done. Because these people now are back in one accord. He says, To send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols. I still think that's interesting. That's the first thing they mentioned. That ye abstain, talking to the Gentile churches now, 
and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Now, obviously, when the Apostle Paul begins writing his letters to the churches, he adds a number of things to that because a Christian's life is to be a testimony of the work that Christ's work has done in their lives. But at this point still, it's the church at Jerusalem. They are with, in one accord. They are one accord in supplication, continuation, exaltation, devotion. And finally, inspiration. They agreed together about what the scripture says about salvation. In the last 25 years, independent Baptists are now divided over what saves a person. And man, if you can't decide right on what saves a person, you're in trouble. You better have that right. I believe everything God says about what saves a person. I believe all the scriptures that God says. You know, just like there are no two people that prayed the same prayer. Matter of fact, some of them didn't even pray. When Jesus came to Matthew, he said, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. You don't find any two people praying the same prayer to get saved. Because it's not about the words that you pray. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Well, read the back of our tracts, and I, I think the sample prayers are fine, but they need to understand they can pray that 20 times in a day, and that still won't save them. They have to put their faith and trust in Christ. Right. If your faith is in your prayer, it's in the wrong place. It needs to be in Christ. Right. It's His finished work, it's His death. His burial, His resurrection. But you see, you have to see yourself as a sinner. Nothing you can do to please God. You have to come to Him as a sinner, deserving hell, going to burn in hell if you don't just put your trust in Him and His work, what He did to save you. And that's it. You see, they simply believed the Scripture. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and with the stripes you're healed. Well, preacher, don't you think that you ought to change your life? No, I think he changes your life when you trust Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The changed life is a product of salvation. And it's important that we get it because the changed life can be the same thing as getting baptized before you get saved or being circumcised before you get saved as they're talking about in chapter 15. You've got to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. Now, that gets down to sound doctrine. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for doctrine, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. It's important. If you don't get your doctrine right, then none of the other stuff's going to be right. you got to have doctrine right. And as I preached on on Wednesday night, dealing with the death of, a man of, of the man of God in first, uh, let's see, first Kings, second Kings chapter 13. No, it's first Kings chapter 13. I'm sorry. Uh, just like we preached then, the scripture's very plain about an awful lot of things. And most of the things, like for instance, if you got something like Hodge's systematic theology, a lot of that stuff isn't even worth my time. I remember Brother Larry um, trying to think of who the teacher was. I had systematic theology. It was Brother Wingett, as a matter of fact. And uh, somebody, one of the preacher boys raised up their hand. They said, sir, do you think that we could be an effective pastor without knowing systematic theology? Like as Hodge or Strong had in their books. And the teacher said, absolutely not. Can't do it. And then he proceeded to spend an entire week's worth of classes on the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6. Were the sons of God giants on the earth? Or were they angels? Which were they? Spent a week. And a little bit later, I had another teacher who taught Christian doctrine. And he believed exactly the opposite of the systematic theology teacher. 
You know, I think I could be fine with not even making up my mind about what the sons of God are in that passage. Now, as I say that, some of you theologians, you already got that down. You already got that figured out. And that's fine, but that's something we can disagree on and still do just fine. What are they? Matter of fact, there's a third interpretation to that. I don't know about any of it, don't care. To me, that's one of those happy corner questions. For those who went to temple, you remember the happy corner. It's where all the Bible students sat around, drank their Coca-Cola, and talked about the major doctrines like how many angels could sit on a pin. Now, we kind of joke about that, but those were some theological discussions that people had. There was just nothing but a waste of time. But we've got plenty here in the Scripture that is very, very plain that ought to keep us focused and in one accord in reaching folks with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, there are more people living in Madison, Alabama than have ever lived in Madison, Alabama. We've got a job to do. And we need to be in one accord to reach them. Right now, there's more people on the planet than there has ever been. And we have a job to do to get the gospel to them. We ought to be in one accord about that. Let's be that. And when we do that, maybe we'll see God do some absolutely awesome things like what he's promised in the scripture. I would say if our churches, I'm not talking about our churches getting together with other churches, but if just each of the churches that stand upon God's book as the final rule of faith and practice decided they'd get in one accord and stop arguing about the color of the walls on, uh, in the painting job that was done or the color of the carpet or whether or not we have chairs or pews, if they stopped worrying about that and just got busy with the things that God said in God's word, we'd see God bring many to himself. Amen. One accord. Is it possible? Well, it was done in Jerusalem for a while, and it can be done here. We've got more. You know, they start out with 120 in that upper room praying. We've got a lot more than 120. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, challenge our hearts tonight, I pray, to be something better than what we've been. Lord, I love this church. I love these people. We have, we've had the privilege of seeing you do some mighty things but may we not be satisfied with what we've seen but want to do even more for you than ever before you said to whom much is given much shall be required we've seen the blessings of the past and now here we are with more opportunity to reach more people than we've ever had dear God stir us up to be of one accord to do that and father we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts and in our lives but we ask it in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed. So one here tonight that simply by raising your hand, you'd be saying to me, Preacher, I don't know if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. But I do want to be saved. I recognize Christ died for my sin, was buried and rose the third day. And he's my only hope. I want to trust him tonight. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that at all in the auditorium? No one's looking around, and I won't come and embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Preacher, pray for me. Pray for me. All right. Are there some believers tonight who would say, I believe God has more. I believe he has more for us and more for me. Please pray for me. What you preached on tonight is what I want. Pray for me. Just slip your hand up. Anywhere in the auditorium, several hands, several hands. Let's surrender to him tonight. Father, thank you for what you've done and thank you what you're going to do. Thank you every heart you've dealt with tonight. Blessing the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name.